ada uang tak berdasar. Entah cuma tak tepat. Anak. Excuse me, sorry. Tell him about the delegate front. And if there's anybody else, speak now. And then there's two more questions over here. So we'll take the so we'll take the gentleman at the back, the lady here, gentleman in the red tie, and then I think there was somebody on the far right. Yeah. Hello, I'm David Lloyd. I'm going to ask for a slightly better answer to Martin Bright's very good question about the possibility of Prince Charles being a bad monarch. And you Prince Charles has very significantly personally abused his position. People always talk about press as uh, being people who use power without responsibility. But he has used power without responsibility, written handwritten notes to secretaries of state in ministries right across the land, interfered in government foreign policy, certainly over Tibet, um, and uh, significantly changed the uh, reputations of several really good modern and leading architects. Now, you may or may not disagree with what he thinks about some of those things, but all that he's done with Prince's Trust and all the other stuff over the years is outweighed by his very significant, uh, in my view, uh, attempts to influence uh, politicians, publicly elected politicians. The monarchy is only useful if it shuts up. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the Queen Mother, two weeks before her wedding in the early 1920s, did a, uh, an interview with a journalist from the Daily Sketch um, and said, I didn't enjoy that. I don't think I'll do it again. And she didn't for 80 years ever speak publicly to a journalist. Now, we know she spoke privately to which may be a useful thing for them to do, but Prince Charles has very significantly affected public politics and hasn't been elected, and is unaccountable, and it's that unaccountable nature uh, which I think would make him uh, unsuited to be a king. Hi, I'm I just have a practical question um, for the Republicans. Um, if we ended up, um, you know, King, Queen, whatever, abdicated, um, and we, like, what would we do with all the, with the aristocracy? Would we have a kind of reconditioning program? So they would, um, and what would we do with all their houses and Buckingham Palace? Would we make it into a luxury hotel or something? Yeah, what, what would we do? Alright, practical question. Gentleman in a red tie just here, and then we'll take the right at the back and then do a big sweep. Thank you. It's uh, Adam Taylor. Um, it's more to answer a question from the panel, really, to, to ask a question. Um, I mean, firstly, Peter Hitchens, I mean, you, you talk about the current UK systems, so it's such a, a, a marvelously liberal system, but you know yourself that. It's been open to uh, quite illiberal laws in the recent years, and going back not just for New Labour, but going back beyond that as well. Um, that isn't because we have a monarchy or because we don't have a monarchy. Countries which have monarchies and countries which have um, elected presidents can uh, be illiberal, and we have become in many ways quite liberal. Um, you also said, well, at the beginning, the opening argument, um, I listened to everybody speak, and it sort of reinforced what I sort of have become as I've become older, and that's sort of a, a pragmatic monarchist, I suppose. I, you know, I, I'm kind of quite happy, as the gentleman from Fabian said, to uh, consent to a monarchy, whilst you know, people, that's what people want, that's fine. I think there are bigger fish to fry, so I agree with you on, on that issue. However, when you spoke, I actually, you sort of woke something quite deep inside me. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, I felt very angry again. Um, <laughs> I've been a Republican for about a decade. <laughs> uh, and you say, you know, why, should, why should we get rid of the monarchy? Why should we have something else? What's one good reason? Well, it's quite a personal point, and uh, you know, I hesitate to bring a personal issue into a debate like this. Um, however, you know, I've concerned my first daughter, she's uh, 11 weeks old, and I see no bloody reason why she shouldn't be head of state if people so chose her to be. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Andrew Gardner. Um, I'd like to go back to the point that was made about tricameralism. Um, we've seen in this country over centuries that each method of stable government can pervert itself. Monarchy can become despotism, aristocracy becomes oligarchy, and democracy can become mob rule or anarchy. We've seen each of those happen in this country, and by having all three stable in Parliament, any two of those can combine 
get rid of the excesses of the third. I think this is a stable system that we have, and I support it. with a bad monarch and particularly with reference to Prince Charles and power without responsibility and unaccountability. Um, a very practical question on what we do with the aristocracy and their houses. Um, although I'm not sure whether that quite fits in with the monarchy but it's, a, it's an interesting question you might have certain people quaking in their boots. And then uh, around whether or not why should we have in this day and age a monarchy why shouldn't any of us be it, aspire to be head of state? So perhaps Joey could kick us off. Well, I think that the um, starting point is uh, the same as I uh, made as my main contribution, which is that our support for uh, the monarchy is uh, conditional. It is uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, it's the least worst form of head of state uh, that we've so far uh, invented. But if it turns out, as some people suspect, that Prince Charles will be an absolutely disastrous head of state because he doesn't do exactly what the key function of a ceremonial head of state is, which is to uh, appear to be completely neutral and uh, uh, appear to, as somebody said, just keep their mouths shut. That is the prime function. Uh, then I think that, um, as has happened before in British history, you will see very significant shifts in both public opinion and also in political action to deal with with the situation. So it seems to me the essence of the constitutional monarchy is that it's exactly that. It's there but only on our sufferance. And uh, if at the end we no longer suffer it, then uh, I think it could be removed. Could we deal with the issue of uh, the uh, aristocracy and their lands and sort of properties? Yes, I think that uh, that would help to employ some of those poor estate agents that are finding it so hard uh, at the moment. And uh, um, uh, could we um, uh, uh, could, could we find a way of choosing uh, a, a head of state without relying on the hereditary principle, a head of state that I'd still want to have all of the constitutional constraints facing uh, uh, the monarchy? The answer is yes, we can, and we know that there are many liberal and fine countries that are able to show us how to do it as well. Okay. Joe, you've spoken a little bit about, about bad monarchs. What would you do tomorrow to change everything? Well, first of all, I think the most important thing is to um, revoke the exemptions that the royal family have under the Freedom of Information Act, because um, it's absolutely disgraceful that we can't find out things about them that we can find out about other people who get public money. And in particular, there are simple things like whenever the royal family comes up with one of those absurd figures, like you know, any cost country eight each for every five years or something to have a monarchy. They exclude the entire cost of protecting the royal family. So that excludes the cost of you know sending um, cops with Princess Beatrice to a nightclub. I mean if, if this family is um, such good value for money um, and, they, and they have nothing to hide, then I think they should consent to full transparency. And if they're not willing to do that, then I think it should be forced upon them by elected politicians. On the point about what we do with all these institutions and people, I think we could have a fantastic tourist attraction called the Windsor Experience. <laughs> and um, it would rotate around the various palaces, you know, so maybe Hollywood in the summer and Buckingham Palace in the winter. And people could have the kind of experience of, um, you, could, you could set up uh, garden parties. Uh, people could experience going to a Buckingham Palace garden party, which is actually a very boring occasion, though you get very nice cakes. Um, and people could just pay to go in. And uh, you would have four members of the royal family if they, if they didn't have another job. Um, actually, you know, appearing as the Queen and Prince Charles as themselves. I, I don't see any, any problem with that. Peter, the Windsor experience, is that something you fancy? Anytime you smile at me, I'm going to smile back because the not smiling back at you has always been made things really black for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, the main thing I have against Prince Charles uh, is the terrible marmalade that, that he makes, um, which I think is indescribably bad. Um, and, and also the fact that he was persuaded out of meeting me once by, by a bunch of advisors who said, Oh, you can't meet him, it'll be 
disastrous thing you've done. Well, quite honestly, if that's the most disastrous thing you've ever done, <laughs> then things are blacker than I thought. But no, I think that uh, I, I, I actually have some hopes for Prince Charles, and I rather hope that he will provoke a constitutional crisis, because I think the really unrepresentative element of our government at the moment are the two dead political parties which dominate our discourse, like two corpses with rigor and mortis propping each other up, neither of them with any serious membership, neither of them with much support, neither of them capable of, of, of achieving much more than 27 to 30% of the vote at the best of times. Um, both of them completely out of touch with the real controversies in the country. Charles, for all of his faults, does think seriously about many things. I happen to disagree with him, for instance, about man-made global warming, but I, I do not think that he is by any means a thoughtless or irresponsible person. And if he were to challenge the supposedly elected, that is to say, bought and paid for um, parliamentary government over some things where it was acting without real public consent, then I think it might lead to an interesting and productive constitutional crisis which might actually get us out of part of the mess that we're in. The, the, the assumption that he will be a poor or bad monarch seems to me to be mistaken. And as for his battles with architects, and you may think the architects he criticized were good, I would think quite a lot of people think those architects were terrible. And if you look around you in, in, in London, the dreadful vandalistic mess that's been made of it, I think I'd, I'd take Prince Charles' side. But it's, it's, it, and that is a, a position, I have to say, felt by many millions of people in this country entirely unrepresented in parliamentary politics. Well, let's so, argue it in public. So, so, sorry? Let's argue it in public. Well, it, it, may be that it's, it's, it may be that it will come to be, he did argue it in public, if you remember, and it may be that it will come to be public, but I don't think that it's necessarily wrong for, for a monarch who feels that there are, there are elements in public discourse which are not being represented by bought and paid for politicians to raise them in any way that he can, and I think it might actually be helpful towards us. I, I don't know whether there are any other things that I, that I need to answer here, but you probably want me to shut up. Well, you have been converting lots of people to, to republicanism. Well, that's all right. I, I, if, if I'd like to have this argument properly rather than, rather, rather than roundabout. People should decide what they want. If, we, if people want a people's republic, let's say so. Then I'll, 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 I'll know to put my passage out before you finally put the lid on it. But I, 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 I do warn you that people's republics are not as nice as they sound. So let's, let's, we've probably got time for the last couple of... Uh, wrapping up comments from Sunday and Ian, I know you've written about how you try and explain Friday to your five-year-old daughter. What, what do you think well, about her possibly that. becoming monarch? And well, it's, uh, I mean, it, as sort of, you know, these people sort of ex-Republicans are on this, and so we haven't entirely sort of aligned our arguments on this. <laughs> but uh, but uh, Joe, please suggest that, you know, abolishing the elections of the government as well. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the kind of, you know, more of an agnostic sense of the things we'll, we'll stay, we'll, we'll say. Uh, no, but I, I do worry about this because, you know, we watch Disney films quite a lot in our house and all of that and so on. So on Friday, you then have, uh, you know, a girl who grew up and married a princess, and you're going to have to have a married a prince. And so on. you're going to have to explain kind of that's sort of how it works. You don't want it to change your the aspirations for you know your daughters. I think and that is a that is a worry. But um, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, uh, people in the end want this in our in our country. I think Mary Robinson was a tremendous you know president of Ireland and symbolised an important moment of change in Ireland because Ireland wanted to change in this way. If we got rid of the monarchy in this country, I think a lot of people would feel quite a deep sense of loss. And people like me who can perfectly see the principle that will be adopted by getting rid of it actually wouldn't gain very much at all, and the aristocracy would still be there in their books about the peerage. And so we've got many, many more fish to fry, who could be more equal like Sweden, and uh, but getting rid of the monarchy will just uh, actually aggravate the monarchy, and we won't get to bring it up there. So, closing comments back from Ian without that Without mentioning the book. <laughs> <laughs> stability, which was mentioned in the back. Good point, but what if the two chambers which block the third are the two unelected ones which block the elected one? And I can only reiterate, it happened in 1914, and it's the people then, reverting to earlier discussions, cannot get rid of the unelected chambers, and that is a constitutional crisis. Now, um, I'm much too polite to talk about the um, personality or the issues involved with Prince Charles, I'll merely go back to the vulgar Marxism that I started with and say he belongs to a, a social class, he has material interests, the positions he has taken has been associated with his social class and his material interests. We've seen that before, we've seen it with George V, we've seen it with Victoria, we've seen it with George III, I would rather not have to see it again. Um, Sundar in, in, in the opening said, what in practice 
does the continuation of the monarchy block. Um, let me give an off-the-wall answer, which I can justify in, um, in drinks afterwards. Religious freedom and equality. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. I'd like to, I'd like to thank um, all of our panellists for this evening's discussion. I sense that, like many of these debates, it could go on um, for much longer, and I hope that it will go on for much longer. Jake's here, and then afterwards, wherever you choose to go, uh, in Canary Wharf, that bastion of egalitarianism. <laughs> Neutral, we neither endorse books nor marmalade, so please do not uh, um, ascribe any of the views of the panelists to, to ourselves. Um, I'm delighted that they have joined us here. Thank you very much to the Oil Prize for organising it. Thank you.